So, today's uh, sermon, My Home Sweet Home, taken from a famous song. <laughs> I'd like to start with a uh, section from Reverend Sun Myung Moon's sermon, and this was, um, <clears throat> this was taken from a speech that uh, he gave back in 1973. And uh, I just titled it, Caution, Please Read the Instructions. And uh, I'll explain more about that later on. Okay. So, <clears throat> here goes. The time has come for the American people to be awakened. Because of the noble beginning of this country, God sent his blessing and promise. The sacrificial devotion of your ancestors was the foundation for God's blessing to this country. If you betray your ancestors, if you betray God, there is only one way for America to go. It will go to destruction. Since America was built on the pillars of faith in God, if God is moved out of the American life, your nation will be without support your decline will be rapid. Sun Myung Moon, God's Hope for America, October the 21st, 1973. So that was kind of a, um, a warning back in 1973. And also, before that statement was made, Reverend Moon went into more detail about the founding of America and how unique and great this country is, and the reason why it is that way. So I wanted to read a section of that sermon so that we can all understand or be reminded, if you've read it before, of what makes America unique and what makes America great. And uh, we'll finish off with a ritual to help us to cement that in our minds. So bear with me as we go through this uh, section from Reverend Sun Myung Moon's speech, God's Hope for America, delivered on October 21st, 1973. America must have seemed attractive to those who were dreaming of a new world. Even though America was unknown territory, it promised them the freedom of worship, worship that they craved. The Puritans felt a strong desire to create a community of their own. America seemed an ideal place, so they made the courageous decision to venture there. They committed themselves to the treacherous journey across the Atlantic. They risked their lives finding strength in their faith, which was stronger than life itself. Think of it. They had to give up their families, their relatives, their surroundings and their country and head towards an unknown land. Their only hope was in God. Every step they took, they depended on God. Their journey was long and there were many storms. They prayed unceasingly to God. They had but one way to turn. They turned to God. When they were sick and dying on the voyage, they had no medicine to take no doctor to care for them, they turned to God. Those pilgrim men and women were one with God, and that is how they survived. Put yourself in their position of total reliance on God. What a wonderful faith. I am sure that the faith of the pilgrim fathers touched the heart of God, and when God is moved, he offers promises. And when God makes promises, he will fulfill them. God determined to give these faithful people the ultimate thing that they wanted, freedom of worship. He then determined to give them even more. I am sure you know, as I have learned, that the Mayflower arrived at Plymouth Rock in New England almost in the dead of winter. Have you guys been to New England in the dead of winter? <laughs> How warm is the weather in the dead of winter, Ron? <laughs> so here we go. They arrived. There was no 
reception committee, there was no infrastructure. They just arrived in the dead of winter, Plymouth Rock. November in New England is rather cold. <laughs> this is uh, Sun Myung Moon, he's born in North Korea, so he knows what cold is. He's describing it as rather cold, so putting that in perspective, that's really cold for the rest of us. The destiny of the newcomers could have been only starvation because there was so little food to eat. Given this fact, it really inspires me to learn about the store of grain in the hold of the Mayflower, which they would not touch even though they were starving to death. They preserved this grain for planting the next spring. This was truly a supreme example of sacrifice. They preferred to die hoping in tomorrow rather than to act in desperation for only a few more days of life. The pilgrims came to this land full of purpose and hope. They knew that this purpose of theirs was more important than preserving their own lives. <clears throat> Nothing could have given them this kind of courage, this kind of dedication, this kind of sacrificial spirit, except their faith in God. When they arrived at Plymouth, the 41 men who had survived the voyage got together and organized their ideas for government. The resulting Mayflower Compact was signed in the name of God. Amen. This is really a wonderful story. This little group of people left Europe with their hope set in God. They grew sick and died in God. They survived in God. They formed their first government and signed their official papers in the name of God. The story of the American Pilgrim Fathers is one of a kind in God's history. It fits into the pattern of the righteous people of history, such as Abraham, Isaac, and Moses. These pilgrims were the Abrahams of modern history. They therefore had to brave many hardships even after the Mayflower Compact was signed. And to read the <coughs> next section of this speech, I'd like to invite Kai Chisholm. Um, <coughs> just take it from here, and then when you're done, just put the page on to the left, okay? Okay, so I'll... Okay, done, yeah. Winter of Heartbreak. During the first winter in America, the population of the hardy Mayflower survivors was cut in half. Each day that winter brought a heartbreaking separation from loved ones. One by one, these courageous pioneers died. Yet their life from morning to night, from dusk to dawn, was centered upon the will of God. God was their only comfort, their only hope, and their only security. God was the principal partner for them. Here was an example of such a rare and pure group of God's people. They demonstrated untiring faith, and God gave them power and courage. They never lost their trust in God and their vision of the future. Their purpose in coming to America was to build a nation where God could dwell, where they could really share fellowship with each other and rejoice in fellowship with God. This was all in God's providence because he needed a nation to serve as his champion for the ultimate and permanent salvation of the world. So another miracle came to the pilgrims. When they were just barely surviving and their population had been halved, the Indians could easily have wiped them out with one stroke. But again, God was a shield for them. The first group of Indians the Mayflower survivors encountered were not hostile. The Indians welcomed the settlers. If the pilgrims had been destroyed at that time, there would probably have been no America for God. God intervened to save his people here in America. This is my belief. God wanted them to settle, and he gave the pilgrims a chance. As the population of the settlement grew, they had to push the Indians away to enlarge their own colony. Of course, this land did not belong to the new American people originally. The Indians were the inhabitants of the land, and the pilgrim settlers must have been invaders in the eyes of the Indians. 
Why then did God give them? Wait, why then did God give these settlers their great chance? Here is my interpretation. God sided with the American settlers because it was in his plan. Furthermore, these American settlers met God's requirements and truly demonstrated an unwavering faith in God. God could not help but give them his promise and fulfill that promise. America's existence was according to God's providence. God needed to build one powerful Christian nation on earth for his future work. After all, America belonged to God first and only after that to the Indians. This is the only interpretation that can justify the position of the pilgrim settlers. This continent of America was hidden away for a special purpose and was not discovered until the appropriate hour. The people of God came at that appointed hour. They came to mold the new way of life. Their principal partner was God, at home in caring for their children, in farming or cooking or building, they let God share their work. He was the only security they had. A farmer might talk to his son working out in the field with him. Let's plow this field in the name, in the name of God. Their everyday life was lived in the name of God. After the first spring visited them, they cleared the fields, planted, cultivated, and harvested the crop, and they attributed all their precious harvest to the grace of God. The beautiful tradition of thanksgiving thus originated. Following the next severe winter, the first thing they did was build a church. At night, at dawn, in the morning, and at noontime, they prayed to God. I am sure they prayed, God, we want to build a place for you which must be better than the old world. We want to build a place where you can dwell and be master. And they also had a vision of the future that this Christian nation would do more good for the rest of the world than any other country upon the face of the earth. I am sure that after their church, I'm sure that after their church, they built a school. They wanted outstanding schools for their children, better than any schools existing existing in the old world. And their homes came came last. After they built their homes, they dedicated them to God. This is the history of your pilgrim fathers. I know. I can visualize each America. I can visualize each America, American as a beautiful, I can visualize each, oh, no, sorry. I can visualize early America as a beautiful America because God was dwelling everywhere, in the school, in the church, or in the kitchen, or in the street. In any assembly or marketplace, God was dwelling. Thank you, Kai. I'd like to invite Renata to read the next section of this speech. The birth of America. Let us examine the people who led the independence movement in this country in 1776. Those freedom fighters were traitors in the eyes of the British crown. But God could use these traitors as his instruments, as his people, and through them he conceived and built the best nation upon the face of the earth. George Washington, commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, tasted the bitterness of defeat in many, many battles. When he finally faced the last heartbreaking winter in Valley Forge, he was serious. I am sure George Washington prayed like this. God, it is you who led our people out of Europe and brought us over here to the new world. You don't want us to repeat the dull, gray history of Europe. You liberated us and gave us freedom. You don't want to see the mistakes in Europe repeated in this land. Let me give you my pledge. I will build one nation under God. Thus, George Washington made his battle God's battle, and therefore the victory won was a victory for God. I know that this victory and the independence of America came because God accepted George Washington's prayer along with the prayers of many other Americans. Mm -hmm. God knew that his champions would work for his new nation, but George Washington, had, George Washington had nothing to work with, and the British Army had everything, power, authority, tradition, and equipment. They were proud of their military strength. The, Amer the American Continental Army had no ammunition and few soldiers. George Washington finally had one weapon only, faith in God. I believe that George Washington's position paralleled David's in his fight against the giant Goliath. David won his battle in the name of God. They both let God vanquish their foe. 
Each of them put his whole heart, his whole being, and his whole sacrificial spirit into the battle, and won. Now it is a significant fact that throughout history, God's people could never be blessed on their own homeland. God moves them out of their homeland and settles them on foreign soil, and there they can become a people and a nation of God. According to the pattern, the American people journeyed in faith out of their homelands, came across the ocean to the new world, and here they received God's blessing. God had a definite plan for America. With, he needed to have this nation prosper as one nation under God. With God, nothing is impossible. So out of the realm of impossibility, the independence of America became a fact. And upon its foundation, great prosperity came. The British army fought for their king. For them, the British crown was supreme. The American army fought for their king. God was their only king, and he alone was supreme. The new world was pioneered in the name of God. America is called the land of opportunity. Here is the soil on which people find opportunity in God. Elizabeth? So I'd like to invite Elizabeth Whitehead to read the last section. Thank you. The Christian tradition in America is the most beautiful thing for foreigners to behold when they come to this country. I learned that every day your Congress is convened in prayer. Your president is sworn into office by putting his hand on the Bible. One day, I, vi I visited a small prayer room in your Capitol building. When your leaders have, have grave decisions to make, they come to this place, kneel humbly before God, and ask his help. There is a stained glass window depicting George Washington on his knees in prayer. Here I saw the true greatness of America. From the highest levels of Congress way down to the rustic customs of the countryside, evidence of dependence on God can be seen everywhere in America. In this respect, America is a unique nation. Even your money, the bills and coins are impressed with such a beautiful inscription, in God we trust. No other nation has such a thing. When, then whose money is it? Your money? Is it American money? No, it is God's money. Every bill or coin says so. You are the stewards, and God has deposited his wealth in your hands. Yes, this nation is not the American nation. It is God's nation. And such a na nation exists for the entire world, not just for America herself. Yes, America is formed as a new nation, a new Christian nation under a new tradition. The shackles of old traditions fell away in America. You must want to build a new nation under God. God's purpose is the salvation of the world and all mankind. Today in America, there, today in America, therefore, you must not think that you have such wealth because you you yourselves are great. You must humbly realize that the blessing of God came to America with the purpose of making it possible for God to use this nation as his instrument in saving the world. If America betrays God, where can God go? If America, rege if Amer if America rejects God, where can God go to, to fulfill his aim? Do you want to let him try to go to the communist world, to underdeveloped countries? God wants to have America as his base, America as his champion. And America has begun in the sacrificial spirit, pursuing God's purpose. America must consummate her history in the sacrificial spirit for God's purpose. Then America will endure, endure forever. America is the miracle of modern history. You have to build the most powerful, powerful nation in, in history in a short time. Was this miracle possible only because you worked so hard? Certainly you did, you did work hard. However, hard work is not explanation enough. If God had not been the principal partner creating today's America, to, today's America would have been impossible. God played a prime role in the American history, and He is the He it, and this He wants America to know.
Thank you very much to all our readers. They were called up on very short notice, <laughs> and they responded affirmatively. I am very grateful. Thank you. So, I appreciate that uh, talk very much because it really reminds me that um, America is a very unique country, and um, its uniqueness is in being different from other countries, and we should always remember that so that America doesn't get tempted to move back towards becoming like Europe, um, but rather to lead the way away from the shackles of those systems of government. Uh, today, uh, I'd like to also um, have a tradition, or at least start a tradition, um, in our church, <laughs> where we remember July the 4th as a, um, as a special day. So I'd like to take a few minutes to remember what the 4th of July is about and to remind ourselves how fortunate we are to be Americans or to live in America. Before America was a nation, it was a dream, a dream shared by many people from many nations over many generations. It began with the pilgrims in 1620 who fled Europe so that they could be free to practice their religion. It continued through the 17th century as more and more people came to the place that came to be known as the New World. In this new world, where you came from didn't matter. What mattered was where you were headed. As more and more people settled, they started to see themselves as new people, Americans. They felt blessed. The land was spacious, the opportunities limitless. By 1776, a century and a half after the first pilgrims landed, this new liberty-loving people was ready to create a new nation. And on July 4th of that year, they did just that. They pronounced themselves to be free of the rule of the English king. We know this statement as the Declaration of Independence. So I'd like to invite two of our younger readers to come up at this point and ask and answer three questions. Maya? Okay. Yeah. You, you figured out what you're going to do. Why do we celebrate 4th of July? Because the 4th of July is the birthday of the American people, the day we choose to become the United States of America, a free nation. Why was America different from all other countries? Because in 1776, all countries were based on nationality, religion, race, or geography. But America was created on the basis of a set of ideas. This is still true today. What are those ideas? Three ideas summarize what America is all about. They are, they are, are engraved on every American coin. They are liberty, in God we trust, and e plur, pluribus unum. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'd like to invite Kai to come up and uh, <coughs> explain more about that, um, what those three things mean? What does liberty in God we trust and e pluribus unum mean? Okay. Do I read just the three things or do I read these two? I can read everything except read a lot. Yeah, okay, 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 okay. Liberty means that we are free to pursue our dreams and go as far in life as hard work and good luck will take us. In God we trust means that America was founded on the belief that our rights and liberties have been granted to us by the Creator. Therefore, they cannot be taken away by people. E pluribus unum is a Latin phrase meaning from many, one. Unlike other countries, America is composed of people of every religious, racial, ethnic, cultural, and national origin, and regards every one of them as equally American. Therefore, out of many, one. Therefore, out of many people, we become one Americans. Yes. 
Right, out of many, one. Very good. So, um, brought up <coughs> some uh, items on this uh, chair over here, and uh, and I've uh, we've we've p prepared special <laughs> gift packages at the at the back, uh, which I've got here. Okay, so we're going to uh, eat and drink these things in commemoration of this event. Okay, the Declaration of Independence. We drink iced tea to remember the Boston Tea Party. No taxation without representation. That's right, was the Patriots' claim as they dumped British tea into the Boston Harbor. Don't they know how to make tea in this country? <laughs> So, we eat a salty pretzel to remember the tears shed by the families who lost loved ones in the struggle for freedom, in the Revolutionary War, and in all the wars of freedom that followed. <laughs> we ring a bell to recall the ringing of the Liberty Bell, which was rung to announce the surrender of the king's army. On the bell are inscribed the words from the book of Leviticus. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. That's what it's inscribed right here. <laughs> and we eat strawberries and blueberries dipped in whipped cream. Why? To celebrate the red, white, and blue of our flag, the symbol of the United States of America. So, we celebrate America's greatness without denying its flaws. There are no perfect individuals, so there can certainly be no perfect country yet. But America has been progressing towards that path. America's national history has its share of shame. The greatest of these is the shame of slavery, which existed at the founding of America as it existed throughout the world at that time. But it should never be forgotten that Americans fought a terrible civil war in which hundreds of thousands of Americans died, and the reason for that war was for the ab abolition of slavery. Let it also not be forgotten that America has fought in more wars for the freedom of other peoples than any other nation in history. America's history is one that we can all be proud of. So, to conclude today, um, I just wanted to share a personal testimony of when I came to America, and uh, that was back in 1991 when dinosaurs still walked the earth. <laughs> and I just remember growing up in Europe and other countries, but my exposure to America was through media, through watching TV shows, through watching movies. And you know, for those of you who grew up abroad, you'll remember the yellow cab and the tall buildings and all this kind of stuff. And then when you come to America, the first day I remember walking on the street thinking I was in a movie set. <laughs> Because this is all the stuff I saw in movies, you know, the New York City cabs are there, and you know, no double-decker buses, which is what I was used to, but instead you've got the American setup. So um, that was back then, and I remember asking for a, being rather thirsty, and asking somebody for a glass of water, please and the person didn't know what I was saying. <laughs> so eventually they realized, oh, you mean water, well, why didn't you just say so? <laughs> so I learned a very important lesson that day, that if you're gonna get along in this country, you've got to speak as the locals do. So since then, I've dropped my enunciation a little bit. My words kind of lean into each other, just like American words kind of lean into each other like that. And um, when I go to England, they think I'm American. And when I'm over here, they realize, yeah, I'm not American, but what are you? And then, or where do you come from? And I tell them, well, I'm a blended British guy. You know, I've got my 
Irish mother, I got my Scottish father, and born in Cambodia, raised in Turkey and Greece and England, and I live in America. So you tell me where I'm from. <laughs> but America is one of those unique countries where you can, you know, as soon as you, you come here from wherever you came from, and you, um, you go through the uh, ritual of earning a citizenship, and you get your citizenship, you are American. And that's really unique. I mean, you go to other countries in the world and it's very different, or it used to be at least, very different. And I remember being in, uh, for instance, in South Korea. And over there, it's, it's very difficult to become a citizen of that country. And in fact, if you have white skin and you don't have you know, dark hair, then you're never really going to be a Korean, even though you get Korean citizenship. Um, and that's okay. But the thing is about America is that it's a melting pot. You know, it's, a, it's every, every culture, every creed, every religion. We're all here. We're all Americans, you know. I mean, that's, think about that. That's, that's an incredible experiment in human history to gather so many different kind of people in one country and all call them, hey, you're American. And that's why I think it's very difficult for us to understand these clan wars and tribal rivalries in other countries. We were just like, what? Just get over it. You know, you're, you're, you're an Iraqi, you know? You're not, you know, this tribe or that tribe or whatever. You're just, you know, you're that, not that particular religion or that particular religion. You're, you know, you're Afghanistanian or whatever. You know, we just find it really hard to understand why people can't just get over their religious and cultural differences and just get along as citizens of that country. And that's really something you take for granted as an American until you travel abroad. And then you realize, wow, I'm really an outsider. <laughs> I'll never be accepted by this culture, no matter how long I live here. So anyway, God bless America. And I thought maybe we would finish off this Sunday sermon with uh, a song, OK? <laughs> to remind ourselves once more. America, what is America? What are the ingredients of being an American? Liberty, in God we trust, and e pluribus unum. So uh, why don't we uh, just finish off by singing this song, okay? Why don't we all stand? God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans wide and foam. God bless America, my 